In 1988, whilst working abroad in Germany, Dr. Christian Schaefer received a strange gift from a fellow academic. It was a small book, about 100 pages, and had an ornate green cover. According to a colleague, it was thought to have been written between 1760 and 1780. When she looked inside, she was surprised to see that the neat handwritten pages were in a completely unintelligible script. Although it had some familiar letters from the Roman alphabet, the text also features Greek lettering and some unique symbols never seen anywhere else. It was clear that the book was a cipher, an encrypted code designed to hide a secret message. The only words she could read were found on the inside cover, Philip, 1866, and at the end, Copiales III, a Latin word related to our word for code. The book came to be known as the Copiales Cipher. For 250 years, its message remained unknown. Until 2011. We now know what it says. Here's how it's done. Uppsala, Sweden, 13 years later. A guest speaker from the University of Southern California was visiting Dr. Schaefer's university. His name was Professor Kevin Knight. He was a specialist in machine translation and had previously created algorithms to automatically translate one language into another, similar to systems like Google Translate. He had previously built a program that could translate Dante's Inferno based on the user's choice of meter and rhyme scheme. But he was no cryptographer. Despite this, Schaefer approached Knight with a book, and the two began to discuss it. Along with Schaefer's colleague at Uppsala, Beata Magiesi, the team soon began to establish that the book was indeed authentic and not a hoax. They handed the cipher to Professor Knight, to take back to California, and with this, the work begun. Being a computer scientist, Knight transcribed the entire document onto a computer so it could be machine readable. He found 88 unique symbols and gave each one a code. This symbol became lip, this one O, and this one ZS. So now with the press of a button, the text went from this to this. But the cipher still made no sense, but at least it was legible for his computer. This would allow him to work quickly able to efficiently run scans to figure out any patterns or future translations. Knight first looked at the Roman letters scattered across the page. He believed that if he isolated them from the rest of the symbols, the message would reveal itself. In this theory, all other symbols were nulls, meaningless characters meant to throw off any cryptographers. Isolating the Roman letters did not seem to reveal much at first. They were scrambled and did not appear to have any meaning. He ran the Roman lettering through his databases of languages, to see if any linguistic patterns emerged within the book. Nothing. The attempt was a failure, and the cipher was still a mystery. Back to square one. Including all the letters this time, he ran a computer scan to see whether any letter combinations repeated themselves in the document. This is a smart way to figure out certain letters, as some letters only ever appear in pairs. For example, in English, the letter Q is almost always followed by U. Quit, question, queen, square, acquiesce, Words like Sadiq and Fakir are of the very few exceptions and are usually imported words from other languages. If he could find unique letter pairs, it would allow him to decipher his very first letters. He ran a scan and this time found 10 unique character combinations in the text. Progress. It seemed that the vowels or circumflexes were frequently followed by a Z symbol or a Pi symbol. This symbol was often followed by this one. In some cases, this pair had a third letter form at the end. This three-letter pattern would allow Professor Knight to make his first breakthrough. Knight already had reason to suspect that the original language of the document was in German. First, the book was originally located in Germany, and second is the inscription, Philip 1866, which uses the German double-P spelling of the name. Knight noticed that in German, C was almost always followed by an H, Nach, Loch, Buch, and so on. Moreover, a CH is usually followed by a T, Nacht, Licht, Macht. So he suspected that the mysterious three-letter pattern was CHT. He didn't realise it yet, but he was right. There are 26 letters in the alphabet, but 88 letters in the Copial cipher. Knight theorised that multiple symbols must have stood for a single German letter. He played around a bit with the characters, and soon discovered that these three symbols all stood for I. It seemed to work and soon he started to assemble small words and sentences. This became dare. This became candidat. This became antvortet. Dare candidate antvortet. The candidate answers. With this breakthrough, Knight continued to work on the code and steadily began to decipher more and more letters and quirks. The circumflexed vowels all stood for E. 
This cross symbol stood for SCH, and the colons doubled the previous letter. Soon, Knight was able to build an entire alphabet. Since he already transcribed a digital version at the start, all he needed to do was run the alphabet through his document and... Success. Before him, lay a text that no one had been able to read for 250 years. He was right. The text was in German. What lay before Professor Knight and soon Dr. Schaefer and Dr. Magessi was a series of rituals that described the initiation of the candidate into a secret group. The text is older than they thought. Originally believed to be written between 1760 and 1780, it was more likely written between 1730 to 1740. Here's the first page of the Copialis cipher. There are some large non-letter symbols yet to be decoded. The team believe that they stand in for actual names of people and roles within the organisation and cannot be decoded any further. First law book of E. Secret part. First section. Secret teachings for apprentices. First title. Initiation rite. If the safety of the is guaranteed and the is opened by the chief by putting on his hat, the candidate is fetched from another room by the younger doorman and by the hand is led in and to the table of the chief who asks him first if he desires to become secondly if he submits to the rules of the and without rebelliousness suffer through the time of apprenticeship thirdly be silent about the of the and furthermore be willing to offer himself a volunteer in the most committed way the candidate answers Yes. The book continues on like this, describing complex initiation procedures and rituals. Except, that is, for the end. The concluding pages offer a political commentary describing the natural rights of man and talks about self-evident truths that man is born free. Similar language to the American Declaration of Independence, some 30 to 40 years after this document was produced making this document one of the earliest to be espousing these sorts of ideas. But who were the authors of the document? It's never made clear in the cipher, but there are some clues. First, this symbol that appears throughout the book. It was believed to be a lip by night, but after studying it, Schaefer believed it to be an eye. Then came the recurring phrase, the light hand. This was a phrase used by a German secret society known as the Oculists a name derived from the Latin word oculus, meaning eye. Officially known as the Great Enlightened Society of Oculists, they were based in the German town of Wolfenbüttel on the outskirts of Hanover. They were a group of academics and surgeons who performed early forms of eye surgery and can be recognized by their insignia, featuring an eye. They were seen as being highly protective and secretive and only admitted the most respected surgeons into their organization this is their public image at least. The existence of a deeply complex encoded cipher implies that there was more to them than just eye surgery. But that we just do not know. The cipher doesn't have any more information. So why the rituals? Why the political commentary at the end? What happened to the group? We know very little more about the oculists and the copy out of the cipher might be the best look into this group we have. We do know that around the time of the document's production in 1738, Pope Clement XII forbade all Catholics from joining a larger, more notable secret society, the Freemasons. Many saw the Freemasons as a secret homosexual cult or a political insurgent group. Others rumoured that they worshipped the devil. Whatever happened, the Oculists were forced underground and the secrets went with them. 250 years later, and our little book emerges. But let's not forget the genius that went behind cracking the Copiala cipher. Naturally, I've oversimplified it a bit, so I've included links below that show Professor Knight and his team's process, with published papers and articles, as well as links to the full document itself. Since the Copiala's decipherment, Knight has used his expertise to approach other cryptic texts, including the Zodiac Killer cipher, and perhaps the most enigmatic document of all time, the Voynich Manuscript. To this day, both remain to be deciphered, even by Professor Knight but that's a story for another day. Goodbye. Hey, thank you for making the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed. So the channel had a spike in views and subscribers since the last video. 
It may be a modest increase compared with larger channels, but to me it means the world and pushes me to make more content. So, if you like the video and want to see more, like, comment, maybe share with a friend. But most of all, subscribe to Hochelaga. Anus, anus, anus.